Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see you folks in. Now, uh, again, I might as well let our television audience know that we've got a lot of empty chairs and uh, one of those rare events when Tulsa weather just didn't cooperate that much. But uh, we're thankful for these hardy souls that have come in for our taping this afternoon. For those of you out in television, wherever you are, we again want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. And I emphasize the informality of it because that was one of the first stipulations I laid down when the folks here asked me to make a television program. I'm not going to come up here in a three-piece suit and tie. And they said, that's fine, so I'm going to maintain, just like I teach my weekly Bible classes, my short sleeve and a pair of slacks, and that's going to be sufficient. And uh, we appreciate the fact that uh, this is what li most of you are, uh, are noticing. We're, we're laid back. We don't try to put on a lot of uh, whatever. And we just want to teach the Word. And I don't want to draw any attention to myself. I want folks to just simply see what the book says. And uh, I think we're making some headway. We're uh, getting a lot of response from uh, even clerical people who are beginning to realize, as one fellow put it, he said, Les, will the Lord ever forgive me for teaching the wrong thing for 40 years? And uh, I said, well, just pray that he'll give you a few years to teach it right. And uh, that's all we can hope for. So again, for all of you out there, we thank you for your prayers, your financial help, and uh, your letters. My, how we appreciate your letters. That's uh, all the compensation we need, really. Okay, we're going to go right in and pick up where we left off. We finished Isaiah 61 in our last taping, and we're going to go into chapter 62 today. And uh, we're going to start right with verse 1, and I want to read a few verses, and then we'll come back and uh, pick them apart, as we usually do. All right, so Isaiah, oh, yes, I want to remind our audience that we are finishing book 62. Okay, sit on the board. Yeah, this is the last part of book 62. And uh, it'll probably come from the printer in about, what, month, six weeks, something like that. So anyway, Isaiah 62, we'll start reading in verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation, now hit some of these key words, the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now here's one place I better stop and remind, because it's been a long time done this. When you see the word Lord capitalized as it is here, all four letters, L-O-R-D, and capitalizations, that is, in reality, Jehovah. It's Jehovah. And uh, so they more or less use the term Lord because the Jews had such an awe for the name of Yahweh or Jehovah. But always remember that Jehovah and Christ are one and the same in personality. And so it's God the Son. Always remember that. There's only one exception to that, and that would be back in Psalms 2. But otherwise, whenever you see this term, Lord, it's Jehovah, and Jehovah is God the Son. And I always go back to John's Gospel to prove that because, you see, the term Jehovah was actually literally translated the I Am. And when you get into John's Gospel, chapter 12, when Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees, and they said, well, who are you? You're, you're a demon. And he says, no. He said, uh, I come from my father Abraham. And then they said, Abraham, who do you claim to be? And then what did he say? Before Abraham was, I am. And so he puts the same stipulation on himself as the term Jehovah implies, the great I am. So always remember that. And when we come to this term, L-O-R-D, capitalized, it's Jehovah, it's God the Son, in his Old Testament character. All right, so we read on that the hand of the Lord in verse 3, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Now remember, this is all directed to the nation of Israel. We aren't dealing with Gentiles per se, except as 
Israel will be the vehicle. All right. Then verse 4, thou shalt be no more termed forsaken, neither shall thy land, see the pronoun, Israel's land, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. And here's the translation of those two terms. Hephzibah means the one in whom I delight, and Beulah meant married. And so here we have those two. All right, now if we can go back to verse 1, for Zion's sake. Now again, you know, I always sort of put the onus on hymn writers, how they have totally disturbed our thinking a lot of things. You sing the old hymn, Marching to Zion, and you get the idea that Zion is what? Heaven. Well, he Zion is not heaven. Zion is Jerusalem. David's throne was on Mount Zion. Hopefully we'll be there in a few weeks and we're going to be on Mount Zion visiting David's tomb and so forth. And it was in Jerusalem. It's not heaven. And so always remember that, that Jerusalem and Zion are synonymous. So for the sake of Jerusalem, I will not hold my peace for Jerusalem's sake. Well, there it's already identified it, hadn't it? I didn't have to. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until... That's a time word. There's coming a time. Now, you've got to remember, Isaiah is writing 700 years before Christ, and yet he's leaping the centuries to the second coming when Christ will return and yet set up his kingdom and his capital will be on Mount Zion. Okay? And so he says, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth speaking of his second coming. And of course, it wasn't delineated that clearly in the Old Testament. And uh, so the prophets and the, the seers and so forth could never figure this out. They knew there were two identities. There was a suffering Messiah and there was a glorious ruling Messiah. But how to bring them together? They had no idea. But nevertheless, as we look back in it now, we can see how the Holy Spirit was guiding the prophets to write concerning those things now that we can understand more fully. And that is the second coming when he sets up his kingdom and righteousness will rule supreme from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And then reading on, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Now, that tells us then that the Jews of the Old Testament economy understood the concept of salvation. Now, a lot of Jews have always had the idea that just to be of the, the blood and the tribe and the genealogy of Abraham, that they didn't have to worry. Their eternal destiny was secure. That's never been the case. Even in Israel's history, there was always a small percentage of Jewish people who were truly believers. And you remember uh, the one I always refer to is Elijah. Elijah thought he was the only one. To, but what did God say? I have 7,000. But again, I've reminded you, if the average population of Israel was 7 to 10 million, 7,000 is only one-tenth of 1%. One That's all. The other 99.9% .9 were in abject unbelief, even in Israel. But the idea of salvation has always been uppermost in the, in the eyes of God. All right, now then, verse 2. Here we have a reference to the Gentiles. God isn't speaking to them. He's speaking to Israel concerning the future of the Gentiles. All right, and the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. Now, I'm going to stop a minute. I didn't intend to do this again. Honey, we're going to go all the way up to Ephesians because... A lot of folks will be kind of quizzical on this. Well, Les, you mean to tell me that Gentiles weren't saved all during that Old Testament time? No, for the most part, they weren't. There, there were uh, exceptions, yeah. But by and large, the Gentile world was in spiritual darkness. And then in order to prove my point, yes, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Now, the Apostle Paul is writing here in uh, 
prison epistles, that puts it in the 60s, doesn't it? 64, 65 A.D. And look how he puts it, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when you hear me constantly refer to the fact that this was only for the Jews and that it wasn't for the Gentiles except as it related to Israel, here it is, plain English. Ephesians 2, verse 11 and 12. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, physically, genetically. So who is Paul writing to? You and I. See, he's not writing to Israel now like the prophets did. Paul is writing to Gentile. And so he says, you in times past were Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by those who were the circumcision. In other words, the Jew would refer to the Gentile as the uncircumcised. Now look at verse 12. Here it is, that at that time, while God was dealing with Israel, all up from Genesis 12 until you almost get to Acts chapter 9, it's all dealing with Israel, with a few exceptions, don't forget that, but here was the lot of the average Gentile, that at that time you Gentiles were without Christ or Messiah, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were not citizens of the nation of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. In other words, Gentiles had no part of the covenants that God made with Israel. They were strangers to them. Consequently, they had what? No hope. And without God in this world. Now, a lot of people have trouble with that. And they said, well, then God wasn't fair. Yes, he was. He gave the whole human race how long? 2,000 years. All the way from Adam to Abraham. Nothing excluded. Every human being on earth had the same opportunity for salvation as the next one. And what they do with it? They walked it underfoot over and over. And they, in so many words, says, we want nothing to do with it. So they had their opportunity, and then what did God do? He brought about the little nation of Israel, and then for 2,000 years, he offered everything to the little nation of Israel, all the way up to the crucifixion. And what does that tell you? Israel did, just like the human race did for 2,000 years also. And so now we've evened the score. 2,000 years, it went out to the whole human race. 2,000 years, it went primarily to the nation of Israel. And now we've come another 2,000 years where once again it's gone out to the whole human race. And by and large, what has humanity done with it again? Walked it underfoot. It's hard to understand, isn't it? Now you see here again, when people say, when, and we'll be talking about it here in just a little bit, when the judgment of God is going to fall, and when they hear people like myself talk about it, they just ridicule and they say, well, how can a loving holy God, bring on this kind of chastisement on the human race that you talk about. How can he? How can he not? For 2,000 years he's poured out his grace on the human race. Now we've just come through a tremendous tragedy and our hearts go out to those people. That wasn't God. God isn't bringing in wrath and judgment today. He's permitting it, of course. But we're under the age of grace. But the day is coming when something like what has just happened in Asia will be multiplied thousands of times over. And it won't just be 150,000 losing their lives. It's going to be billions. And we'll be looking at that later this afternoon, hopefully. But that isn't because God was unfair. God has now gone 2,000 years offering salvation full and free to anyone and everyone regardless of who they are, whatever their station in life. And then they turn around and say, God's unfair. No, it's mankind who's unfair. They won't accept his grace. They won't give him credit for all their blessings. And one day his patience is going to run out and we're getting close. And I think this whole tsunami thing is just a little warning, just a little window of what's coming. And uh, it's nothing 
compared to the wrath and vexation. Yes, then it will be God's wrath. Today it's not. He's permitting it. But uh, I think it's the satanic powers that institute it. Because never forget, nothing thrills Satan more than to see the object of God's love suffer. That's why he does it. He just knows that he tears at the heart of God by causing his created creatures to suffer. And God in his own wisdom permits it, of course, but don't ever blame God for catastrophes until we get into the final seven years. Yes, then it's going to be the outpouring of his wrath and vexation. All right, so remember now that when I say that Israel alone is being addressed and that the Gentiles had no part of it, here it is. The Gentiles were strangers to the nation of Israel. They were aliens. They had no part in the covenant promises. Consequently, they were without hope and without God in the world. All right, now then you can come back with me to Isaiah chapter 62, and uh, we'll move on. Verse 2 again. And the Gentiles, through Israel. Now remember, this is back in the Old Testament before there's any hint that God is going to set Israel aside and turn to the Gentiles in grace. There's no hint of that back here. Not the slightest. Everything in your Old Testament is looking forward to the time when, when Israel would have her king and the kingdom and they could be the priests of Jehovah and be the instruments that would bring salvation to the Gentile world. The Old Testament knows nothing of it. Nothing else but that. Uh, I'm going to take time. Come back with me to Exodus, chapter 19. Exodus 19, and this is the whole foundational concept of God dealing with Israel regarding the Gentiles. Now, it hadn't happened yet. They dropped the ball. And I think it's going to be 99% fulfilled by the 144,000 during the tribulation because they are going to fulfill the Great Commission. They're going to go into every tongue and tribe and dialect in that less than seven years of time. Israel has never done it before. The church has never done it. But Israel will through the 144,000. But that wasn't mooted in the Old Testament. wasn't even hinted at. But this is what God was looking for. All right, Exodus 19, and we usually like to start at verse 5, where God is speaking to Israel through Moses. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then, if they're an obedient nation of people, then you shall be a treasure unto me above all people. Where does that put the Jew? Above every other nationality on earth, by God's decree, by his sovereign design. You shall be above all people. Why? Because all the earth is mine. What does that tell you? His sovereignty. It's his earth. It's his universe. He can do with it whatever he wants. And so in that sovereign design, he's going to lift Israel as the favored nation. But for what purpose? Next verse. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Not just the tribe of Levi. Every Jew from whatever tribe was to be a priest of Jehovah, a go-between. You see that? Now, let me show you the other verse that shows how beautifully that can be put together. Still keep Isaiah. We're coming back to it in a little bit. But jump all the way up now to Zechariah. And Zechariah says it so specifically that this is what Israel was offered. Now, they rejected it, remember. They never cashed in on it. Oh, let's see. I want uh, Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20. Zechariah 8. Verse 20. Now keep all this in mind. Every Jew is to be a what? A go-between, a priest. No matter what his tribe. And when would it be? When they have the king and the kingdom. All right, now look what I had, Zechariah. 
Verse 20, chapter 8. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. This is what Jehovah, this is what God the Son is telling Israel. It shall yet come to pass. Remember, I think I mentioned the last taping. God doesn't lie. It's going to happen. Hasn't yet. It's still going to. And it shall come to pass that there shall come people, the inhabitants of many cities, the inhabitants of one city will go to another and they'll say, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, to seek the Lord of hosts. And where will that be? In Jerusalem. I will go also, this Gentile says. Now verse 22. Yea, many people and strong nations. Is that all Jew? No. This includes all the Gentile world now. And strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts. Where? In Jerusalem. That's what your Bible says. And to pray before the Lord, that is, before Jehovah, or before God the Son, or Jesus the Christ, as we know him. Now look at verse 23. My, this is plain English again. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days... It shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the language of the nations, even take hold of the skirt of him that is a priest of Levi. No, that's not what your Bible says. Take hold of the skirt of whom? That person that's a Jew. See? Why? Because he's a priest. He's their go-between. And so they'll take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, gladly follow you. Why? We have heard that God is with you. Now that's just a couple out of many prophecies concerning Israel's role in this coming glorious kingdom when their Messiah would rule and reign over all the nations. All right, now then I think we can come back to chapter 62 of Isaiah. Remembering that now, that the Gentiles of Isaiah's day have nothing to do with the God of Israel. The Jews have nothing to do with those pagan Gentiles. It's all promised for some future time. All right, but the day would come, verse 2 again, where the Gentiles will see thy righteousness. Remember how that fit now with what we just read? They will say to that Jew, we will go with you, for we know that God is with you. All right, here it is. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy what? Glory. Do people see glory in a Jew today? Hardly. Oh, they may recognize their wealth and their, their uh, intelligence and all the other things that they've got going for them, but their righteous glory? Hardly. But the day is coming. All right. And uh, all the kings thy glory, and now reading on to verse 2, thou shalt be called by a new name, by the, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now verse 3, thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Now do you see what God is saying? That's Israel's future. They're going to be the pride and joy of the God of Abraham. How does another one put it? The apple of his eye. Everything of God's blessings and glory will be focused on that little nation of Israel. And then they try to discredit all this and try to tell us that God is all through with the Jew, that they disappeared after 70 A.D.? Heavens, no. Their glory is still yet out in front. It's still coming, and it's going to be beyond description. Well, I could just take you back to so many places, how that over and over. Now, I'm going to take you a minute to Jeremiah 31. We may have looked at it in our last taping, but if we did, it certainly won't hurt to look at it again. We've been looking a lot at their material blessings. And after all, that is the way God has always blessed Israel, was through earthly promises because they're God's earthly people. But don't ever forget that God is going to bless them just as much spiritually. 
they're going to be spiritual pride and joy of Jehovah God. All right, Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. It's what we call the new covenant. It has nothing to do with us Gentiles whatsoever. A lot of people try to put us under this covenant, but if they can find me someone that is already practicing the results of this covenant, I'd like to meet them. It sure isn't this person, and I don't think any one of you can claim it, but Israel will one day. All right, here it is, 31, 31. Behold, the days come. That's a promise again, see? That the Lord saith that I will make a new covenant, a new covenant something that's never been done before. I will make a new covenant, not with the church, not with the Gentiles. Who? Israel. See how plain this is? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Not just the Levites, the whole nation. See? All right. I will make a new house covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, not the covenant of law with all of its burdens and restrictions. No, it's not going to be that covenant. Now verse 33, but this shall be the covenant. This is what's going to happen spiritually to the Jew who comes into the kingdom economy. This is the new covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord. Now watch what God's going to do. I will put my law in their inward parts. In other words, it's just going to consume them. And I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Now, can the Jew today claim to be God's people? No, they are ben Omai. They are not God's people because of their unbelief. But the day is coming when every Jew will just exude the very presence of God. And that's why the Gentiles will immediately recognize and they'll say, well, we're going to go with you because we know God is with you. Hadn't happened yet, but it's going to and then when you read on to the end of the chapter, here is the guarantee, and I'm pretty sure we did this last taping. We read this to show people that God is not through with the nation of Israel. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Veldick.